Hi, everyone. I'm Tony Asaro. I'm the SVP of Strategy and Business Development for Hammerspace, and I'm going to give you an overview of a global data environment. So there's a lot of elements to the global data environment, um, and it was designed to make uh, billions of files accessible uh, to your users and your applications, regardless of physical uh, location, uh, providing accessibility, availability, and protection of your data uh, that scales massively in both terms of performance and capacity. Now, the first element is our global file system. This creates a single logical systems to multiple locations, data centers, uh, in the cloud, uh, et cetera, uh, allowing access from your users and your applications wherever they may be. And uh, in a global economy, they're scattered everywhere. And they need access to their network shares, which often consists of billions of files. And we enable that, making it very efficient, cost-effective, and fast to get them the files that they need when they need them. And in many cases, even before they need them. We support heterogeneous storage. We can use your existing infrastructure, uh, whether it is on block storage, whether it's on file storage, whether it's in object storage, whether it's in the cloud. What we like to say is that we right size the infrastructure and store data based on performance, based on cost, location, availability, uh, and dur durability, et cetera. We support the NFS and SMB protocols. Uh, and we have a CSI driver for, for Kubernetes environment. All right, the next element of our global data environment is our universal data access and orchestration layer. So this basically eliminates data gravity. You can move data between any of this infrastructure transparently, live, and non-disruptively to users. And you can do it at a file granular level. So you can move specific files to the users, to the applications uh, when they need them, uh, and based on different uh, attributes uh, at a file granular level. And the last part of uh, the uh, global data environment is our application integration. So we are integrated with different applications. Uh, for example, uh, we're integrated with Snowflake. We can move file and file metadata into their environment, bridging the worlds of both unstructured and structured data. Uh, we're integrated with uh, uh, AI machines, Amazon recognition, computer visions. We can actually take the tags that those systems put out and put them into our file metadata. So our file metadata is customizable and we can harvest that metadata to make things like images and videos more self-descriptive and more manageable. We're integrated with Elasticsearch and with user applications uh, such as Autodesk ShotGrid so that production managers can literally just with a single click move data where they need it uh, in order to get it to their artists, in order to get it to render farms, et cetera. So what are we? We are a software defined data platform. So we are software only. We don't have an appliance, a physical appliance. Uh, we support commodity servers and we work with heterogeneous storage underneath us. The two major components of Hammerspace is our metadata servers, right? So that's number one. Our meta, we've disaggregated the metadata from the data. So this is not just a presentation layer, this is also a control layer. So while we've disaggregated the metadata from the data, we've also disaggregated the control plane from the data plane. Any metadata attribute you can create a policy around. File name, file type, file size, access date, creation date, last modified date. And you can create multiple rules around this to move data where you need it, to protect it in the way that you need it, to access it the way you need it. The next component is our DSX nodes. These are our data movers, our data replicators, and these are a scale-out architecture. You can have from two to 60 nodes in a scale-out architecture in order to scale up your performance. We support SMB, NFS uh, in shared environments. Uh, we also support uh, NFS 4.2, and we also have Kubernetes CSI drivers to support both block and file applications. We work on bare metal and virtual machines. We support every virtual machine you can think of, uh, including uh, VMware, uh, Hyper-V, uh, we support KVM, uh, we even support uh, Nutanix Acropolis, and we support all of the cloud virtual machines as well. And it's important to note that we are a parallel file system on the back end. So we're using NFS 4.2 on the back end to parallels IO, even with legacy protocols like SMB and NFS 3. So you can have multi-threaded IO in the back end. We also support our DMA on the back end as well in order to get you high scalable performance. And we support any mix and match of storage. You can have spinning media, you can have NVMe, uh, you can use cloud, object, NAS, et cetera. So we don't, 
our goal is this, is that right now storage is the subset, right? It's a superset, right? Uh, data is subordinate to storage. And what we do is we make uh, the data the first citizen and so that the storage is subordinate to the data. All right, we have a functionality called data in place assimilation. So what does this do? Um, so in most cases where you are going to replace a, a NAS system uh, with another NAS system, you have to do a full data migration in order to get operational. In some cases, our customers have told us this has taken several months uh, to do a full data migration before they can go live. What we do instead is that we scan the file systems metadata, the third party NAS systems metadata. We replicate that metadata and put it into our Anvil servers. And now we can start serving IO requests within less than a minute after this process starts without having to move any of the data. So we can start serving read write requests in less than a minute. Uh, and that uh, storage system, uh, that NetApp or that uh, Isilon or the Cumulo, uh, that becomes our backend storage now. We did not have to move any data. Now, of course, we're all about data mobility. So in some cases, customers say, well, look, I have a data set I want on NVMe storage. I want new uh, processors and faster processors, et cetera, on that. So we can create a policy to say, hey, look, uh, any data that's been accessed in the last two weeks, put it on NVMe. Uh, in the previous animation, when you started talking about, you know, incorporating the data by, uh, you know, uh, assimilation, assimilation mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that I can't access the, uh, the NAS system anymore. The original NAS system anymore? Oh, yeah, so, over. so you cut over. Share, yeah, I understand your question. So, in other words, what we do, and you have to think about us as a full NAS solution. So, if you were going to replace vendor A with vendor B, uh, then yes, they will take over the namespace and then the clients will read right to them. So, in the shares that we take over, and this is, happens at the share level, we become the namespace. So, yes, the client has to be remapped to us. Okay. And then we will serve read write requests. However, and this is important, is that it's not all or nothing. Not all of your file, not all of your shares have to be a global file system, right? They, there are some that are just in the data center and they just want to leave it there. So we have customers that maybe have a hundred, a thousand uh, shares on their uh, third-party NAS solution, and we only take over two, three, six. So we can coexist with those other file systems uh, on the same hardware platform. So it's not all or nothing in our case. And the, and the cutover is. During the assimilation process, can I be reading and writing to the, directly to the NAS box? That's right. So the, the, the cutover happens as soon as we become live, which is, I, as I said, in less than a minute. Uh, and then you remap the- uh, But during, the cutover, during that assimilation process, can I be updating data or is it offline? Uh, at that point, we become, yeah, it's offline. It's, it's online with us at that point, once the assimilation process starts. So, so the answer is that, I know that you're shaking your head. The answer is that we, as soon as the assimilation process and our- I understand when the assimilation process is over. That's not the question, Tony. The question is during the assimilation process, which lasts a minute or two, is, is the NAS system active to the host or is it not? It is not. Thank you. You're welcome. So in this environment, we have our, uh, now that we've assimilated the environment and we are an active file system, uh, we replicate the metadata to other locations uh, so that now this becomes a part of the same global file system. At this point, no files have been actually replicated in these other locations. Uh, the metadata is now available to them. Uh, and I will go into how this process works. But once we present metadata in these other locations, they become part of the same namespace that spans multiple locations. Let's dig into this a little bit deeper. So let's say in New York, you have a Hammerspace NAS solution with a billion files on it. You replicate the metadata to other locations in Tokyo, it, they're using the cloud. Uh, and in London, they have another data center. So we've replicated the metadata in those environments. And now the users in those environments uh, can access and see all of the network shares that you've given permissions to uh, that are based in New York. From their point of view, for all intents and purposes, it is a local file system. But at this point, we haven't replicated any of the files. But you need to replicate files because you don't want to just replicate metadata everywhere. So what we do is we have a combination of our policy-driven services at a file granular uh, level. So in London, let's say they need 10,000 files that are part of a project that they're going to work on. You create a policy to replicate those 10,000 files, and they will be pre-staged in that environment. 
Uh, perhaps Tokyo has 2,000 files that they need replicated, and you replicate just those 2,000 files to them. Now, if a user needs to access a file that is not part of that policy-driven replication process, uh, then you can also replicate files on demand. So if a user accesses a file, it will be replicated to them on demand as well. Now, this is not system A talking to system B talking to system C. This is all system A throughout the entire environment. So if a file is changed in Tokyo, it will be reflected in London and New York. And you're not limited to three locations. You can do six, eight, 10, 20, et cetera. So we have what we call objective-based policies. So this is what I was talking about, the metadata. Based on different metadata attributes, you can create uh, different policies that drive our file granular data services, um, driving, driving all through our metadata environment. Uh, we have customers who have automated their workflows uh, so that, uh, that based on a trigger, uh, whether it's time of day for snow, uh, for um, follow the sun, uh, whether it's because of some milestone has been reached, uh, or whether it is actually manually automated with a click, uh, we move data into different data centers and environments to users and et cetera. Our global data orchestration allows you to have data be moved in multiple clouds, multiple object stores, multiple locations throughout the world. And again, it all looks like a single pool of storage to the users and to the app applications. We have tiering, we have a feature called undelete. So this allows you to create a protection policy uh, for data that's being modified and created within your backup windows. So you might say, well, look, I do a backup every 24 hours. So I wanna create an undelete policy on files that are created uh, uh, modified within a 24 hour period of time. And if those, that data is, uh, if those files are accidentally or maliciously de deleted, we will keep a copy of it off of the live tree uh, that can be recovered uh, so that um, you don't lose anything. Uh, this is uh, also being considered in, uh, in a lot of environments for ransomware protection, uh, allowing you to uh, protect yourself against uh, ransomware attacks that actually delete data, copy it, and then encrypt it. We also do file versioning. So as you're making changes and modifying your files, you can roll back to an early version of the file. And again, all of this is done uh, with our objective-based uh, policies. And we support other features like Worm. And again, file granular, so you don't have to do a whole bucket. You can specific files uh, to Worm, uh, dedupe, compress, uh, et cetera. 